Hello everybody, welcome back to Arthur Next Place Pillars of Eternity. Um, so we are going to start making our way over to Deerford Village by way of Stonewall, Stormwall Gorge. Uh, and this is probably going to allow us, I think anyway, will allow us to finish off the garden. And I haven't really thought about what I'm going to start working on next. Maybe start working my way towards the warden, the warden's office, so I can start doing bounties. Lord Burnweger, cruel ruler from the north, has arrived at the stronghold. Botanical garden construction completed. Okay. Bad visitor, minus three. Leaving in seven days, 21 hours. Pay off 250 copper pieces. Leaving in seven days. To, uh, let's have the priest. Get rid of him. Um, all right, and then let's build. Towers. Towers of Sid Noir San Hive of the Walls of the Stronghold. Upgrading towers will grant a perception bonus. Um, there's the library. Uh, we already have the, the, the merchant stalls. You have weapons and armor merchant, as well as a dexterity bonus. Curio shop. Parts of exotic creatures. And generates a random creature part every turn. That sounds good. Maybe I'll do that. Uh, oh, no, let's do the Warden's Lodge. And start doing some bounties. Uh, sorry, uh, repair the courtyard pool. Yeah, let's do the uh, warden's lodge, and then probably the um, curio shop. Ooh, this is a big map. Settlers arrow. Does this unlock anything? Nope. Where Barrel Druid. Interesting. Hey. Let's see. Hi. I'm here. Um, let's do a hobbling shot to that one. And then eh? do a knockdown to that one. Yeah. And let's see how that <laughs> You're attacking this one, okay. Why don't huh? you attack that one and do a mark. You... Mm. Whoops. Point the way. Did you not... Did I miss? Mark that one. Okay. Mm. You... Uh, attack that one as well. I don't think we... Shadow! 
Yeah. Uh, worth it. Um. You grave minority. You are seven. No, you don't need. I'm here. Why are you taking so much? What is this zapping? Uh, returning storm. That's really Spirit shield. Plus three damage bonus reduction plus thirty concentration. That's really good. Um, let me leave that to the monk for now. Wizard's double on mustache. I'll take the money. That's a lot of money. And wow, these guys have some nice gear. Nothing I can okay. use though. Pilgrim's Crown. Awesome Pilgrim's Crown. It's another fine enchantment I can do now. Yeah. DR4. Yeah, she's gonna destroy that lion. That's it. Uh, not quite. This thing is doing the job. Okay. Didn't take a little bit of damage doing it, but not too much. Of course. Alright, unlock anything yet? Meeting. Quite a few of them. Lion country, huh? Um, okay. Let me delegate that. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Oh. Let's 
do... Go ahead and do one of those. Yes? And... One of those. Ah, where's Sun Rock? Knocked out. Alright, I think we can do the rest of this with Ooh, that's not good. Hmm. Oh. Huh. I'm here. Eh? I'm here. Uh, market. And uh, heavy wounds. No, you eh? Still at maximum health. Hey. Can't complain about that. Being like a off tank with an infinite amount of health. Well, not hmm? an amount of endurance, but an infinite amount of health, basically, because he never takes health damage. Deer. More herbs, though. Oh, there's one. Oh, what's this? The bright sun casts its light on a pattern in the ground. You kneel to get a better look. The stone here has been carved with a few simple shapes. A small circular indentation marks the center, and a much larger circle surrounds it. You see what appears to be writing above the two circles. Alright, let's look at the writing. The curving, twisting runes are strangely familiar to you. You recognize them as ancient and Gwythian. They read, All things end only to continue anew. Enter now at dusk that we may all experience a new dawn. In a smell as it looks like it was intended to hold something specific. Several shapes have been carved along the outer ring, though it must have been though most have been worn away, you make out a crescent above the center. All things end only to continue anew. There must be like an entrance to something there. If we had the object that goes in the middle and it was dusk. Maybe we could enter. Eh? Hey. Yeah. Hmm? Um... 
Hi? Do one of those. Two can play at that game. Bad. Hey. along the top of the gorge, presumably to Deerwood, to Deerford Village, yeah. The other one goes down the gorge, off towards Twin Elms. So is this, are these the right cliffs? They don't seem to be. This is the druid recruitable. Chewing on a piece of untricked meat, a small orland dressed in tattered leathers offers a mumbled greeting and waves his hand. Despite his pleasant smile, the upper right portion of his face is in a sorry state. An eye patch stitched with a stylized eyeball wraps around his head, and his ear is, ma is a mangled remnant that twitches and spasms while the other ear perks up at your approach. Next to him is the splayed carcass of a deer that appears ripped open by a bear or wolf. You hear a gurgling rumble next to you. Sigani places her hand on her stomach. Her eyes are on the carcass, still fresh. Idumak's pink tongue rolls out of its mouth. If this is your deer, you need a new game warden. Name's Heravius. Hungry? I can't eat all this. First catch of the day, help yourself. Ah, uh, What killed it? One ornery Stelgar. Though looking at the deer's insides, it had a malformed but delicious heart, and would have been dead within the year regardless. Galloway chose a fitting end for this fine animal. Pardon me, I shouldn't pray with my mouth full. Ah, uh, what brings you here? Other than the delicious venison, new trees to document, new animals to sketch, new sights to be seen. I've learned as much as I can from the druids of my circle. I'd rather wander and learn than take root and stagnate. So if you're traveling the Deerwood and need another set of hands, I'd welcome the safety of a group. Why so eager? I'm a stranger around these parts, and I've had enough of solo travel for the time being. But it was just an offer, friend. If you have no need of an experienced druid, so be it. Uh, Splendid. of course I'll accept. It'll be an honor to run with a pack for a change. Uh... Hmm... Do we get rid of him? Or do we swap him out? Uh, I do want to adventure with him, but I also, like, this is like exactly the wrong time. Uh, so I'm going to not adventure with him right this second. And instead... I'm going to 
to run along the edge of these cliffs and so just make sure that these are not the cliffs my hunter means, unless it's this spot. Um, let's see, it's currently high noon, so we're not anywhere near dusk anyway. Alright, let's go down and explore the bottom of the gorge. So stale guard killed those. Those are supposed to be pretty fearsome if the stories that I have seen are any indication. This is water? This is water. Okay, then how are we supposed to get to Twin Elms? Hmm, that must be Act 3 or something. Well, In the meantime, there's nothing for it but to go to Deerford Village. idles by the road, watching the village across the river. He nods as you approach. The cowled figures near, standing near him fall silent. Greetings, friend. A slow smile forms his guys. You, I've heard of you. Word has it you've been busy in Defiance Bay. He draws closer. I'm busy, too, and eager to finish my business and get back to the city. Sounds like we're both too busy to stand around chatting, then. <laughs> uh, no. What business is that? Haven't you heard? There's a murderer on the loose, said to have gone mad with grief and strangled a dozen healthy children when her own was hollowborn. He nods at the figures with him. We've come all the way to Defiance Bay to bring her to justice. So why are you standing around here? She's hiding out in the village. We'd go in after her ourselves, but the problem is she knows our faces. There's no telling what she'd do if she saw us coming, and we'd like to avoid any further unnecessary bloodshed. Her name's Nafir. She's in Orland. We want to get her out of town so that we can deal with her cleanly. She knows we're looking for her, but if someone were to convince her that it's safe to leave... If she's a mass murderer, why didn't the Duke send the Crucible Knights after her? Powers that be want to keep things quiet, for obvious reasons. Better not to cause a fuss, and certainly better not to startle her and do something drastic. Dude, you have Shady written all over you. I am not so sure about this. A mad woman like that is everybody's problem, friend. Just keep an eye out. If you come across her... Remember what I told you, I promise I'll make it worth your while. I don't know what she is, but she's not a mass murderer. What exactly does she do? Huh. Yeah, I do not trust these people. Not one bit. They're not acting like law enforcement agents, that's for sure. The big inn. It's like t three times as big as any of the other buildings in this tiny town. Let's have a look inside the temple. Out with you! I already told you what. I'm sorry. I thought you were one of those ruffians. Ruffians? These times we live in. How may I help you? Uh... What happened to you? I never saw their faces. Strange hooded men asking about those ruins. Cleoban Relog. 
Most of the brigands who come through here asking about the ruins are looking for a few ancient trinkets. But these people knew the name, and they were in a hurry. Hmm. They wanted to know where Cleoban Relog was. I tried to keep it from them, but I couldn't hold out forever. I don't know what they were up to, but it can't be good. Mm -hmm. That does sound like a leaden key, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, can you tell me where to find the ruins? The Glanfarthen tribe that guards the ruins will kill anyone who trespasses there. And they'll retaliate against us, too, if history is any indication. We've had too many fortune seekers stir up trouble of late. If I'm to tell you, I'll need to know your reason for wanting to go. I'll be honest. A dangerous plot is unfolding there, and I've got to stop it, because I am a big damn hero. If that's the case, then we may already have trouble headed our way. I'll have to take you at your word. You'll find Cleoban Relog here. Whatever trouble you find there, please end it quietly and try to stay out of the ruins. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, sure, old man, I'll try. Tell me more about Deerford. Folk there tend to keep to themselves. They do as they do in most towns that's deep in the Deerwood. They're suspicious of travelers, but with all the brigands and refugees moving through the area, who can blame them? This is a temple of Barath. What can you tell me about Barath? Barath is the most universal of all the gods. It oversees portals and cycles of all kinds, even life and death. Under Barath, an ending is merely a passage to another beginning. Barath has many representations across time and cultures. Around the Deerwood, you'll commonly see a description depicted as a pallid knight or the usher. The Glenfothians, however, know it as Bunin e Anku and Anku e Bunin. I've never heard of those. It means life and death and death and life, respectively. You see them as two skeletal figures, one male and one female. Explorers have found them carved in opposite each other in doorways, but I know of no particular legends to speak of them. Alright. Pallid Knight is one of the youngest manifestations of Barath, but a familiar one nonetheless. Stories describe her as a gaunt knight in black armor with black eyes, black hair, and milk pale skin. She demands an impossible toll from travelers who have tarried too long on her lord's road. Some challenge her only to slay themselves in the process. And the Usher? Kith have written stories, songs, and poems about the Usher for centuries. Sometimes he's folk, sometimes dwarf, and sometimes merely a walking skeleton. He never speaks, but he guides the way to death and the next life. He also creates the circumstances for the wayward to stumble into their own graves. Okay, thank you. Selby, you have anything to say? <laughs> It's an interesting looking statue. Alright. Well, the first part of our reason for being here was certainly easy enough. The feeling we're going to be coming back and killing those guys, but. We'll see. Uh, maybe mother. What's this? Deer for the mail. Sure. Pop into the mill and see what uh, anything's brewing or grinding or baking or. I guess it would be grinding in a mill, wouldn't it? Indeed it would. Nobody to talk to in here, huh? Alright, well, it's still 60 experience. <laughs> and having to sit through a loading screen. Monsters like this, and damn the rest of the gods too. What monsters? 
A man paces angrily in front of a wrecked animal pen, his sun-weathered face twisted with ire. He's so wrapped up in his fury that he doesn't seem to know with you. Galloid slobbering beast, blazing bloody effigy, thrice damned salty wench and her soggy... Uh... That's probably not the best way to pray to the gods. Fat lot of good they've done me so far. Just look at this mess. My pen ruined and all but a few measly runs gone. Um... Calm down and tell me what happened. Wife's always telling me to mind my temper. Just breathe deep and count to ten. An ogre moved into the area not long ago. Folk have been seeing glimpses and tracks out in the woods, but it seemed to be staying away from town, or so we all thought, till it made off of my pigs. Now everyone's afraid it's going to develop a case for Kith, if it hasn't already. Did you see the ogre take your pigs? What else would have destroyed my pet and made off with my herd? And at the same time, the rest of the village is seeing a ten-foot monster in the forest. I know it's too late to get my pigs back, but I set my mind at ease to see that you, that thing's head shorn from its neck. In fact, you bring me its ugly pate to me, and I'll trade you something that's of less use to a farmer like me than to a rowdy-looking sort like yourself. Uh, what do you know about this ogre? It's the same as any other, I'm sure. A big, ugly son of a bitch with a nasty temper and an appetite to match. Trigal could tell you more. He claims to have seen it in the wood and find him in his shop by the broken tower. But it's got to be tiny compared to the sort of beasts you see up in the living lands. Uh, I'm sent to find an Orland named Fire. Never even heard of her. You th hmm, I wonder if it really was the ogre. Probably. But not definitely. A young elven noblewoman? Okay, let's go see what this grieving mother has to say. We can poke our head in the weapon shop and see if they have anything. Middle-aged peasant woman is dressed in brown leather cloth draped down to her knees. Her hands are working at separating stringy, colorless vegetables from a pile before her, stripping the heads off the long, fibrous stems of the paring knife. She discards the stems one by one, placing the heads of vegetables into a small, cradle-like basket in front of her. She doesn't greet you as you approach. You're not sure she even knows you're there. Excuse me. Who doesn't respond? She keeps stripping the heads from the vegetables with a steady rhythm. She may be deaf. There's no indication she heard you. All right, study her. First glance, she seems nothing more than a middle-aged woman, unremarkable, maybe less stern than most, who seems more focused on the weaving in her lap than her surroundings. Yet you suddenly notice she's not stripping the vegetables before her any longer. She's weaving, and the vegetable pots are now missing. She still pays you no mind, her brown locks torn and snagged from lack of washing, like many of the townsfolk you've seen. There's a strange blur to her, even the motions of her hands seem to be playing with the threads that lack color, and a shape that lacks interest. It may be that she's half-minded or deaf, but something feels wrong. As you watch, her nibbing takes an odd cadence, and you have a terrible suspicion that something lurks beneath what your eyes are showing you. Her brown hair is long, almost impossibly to the length of her hands. As you follow the streams of her locks downwards, the hair has become long and black, splitting off into threads of black and silver, wrapping around her hands. She is forming a soul cradle with the threads, braiding a net in front of you, each finger long and sharp like a series of knitting needles, almost hypnotic. The silver and black strands of her hair weave together with silver predominating as a highlight and the black overshadowing it. Suddenly you are calm. You are on a plateau, almost the height of the tower, several stories high. The plateau is like a table lying beneath a clear sky, and beneath the plateau, surrounding it in all directions, a forest, hazy with mist, although whether it is actual mist, or distance, or a recollection. Resting in the curve of a natural arch above you is the great copper bell, half again the size of a man, hanging at attention, as if looking down at you in the event unfolding before you. The plateau is soaked in the sun, and the rock beneath you is rough and warm. The sky forms a cradle around you. You feel different, not disembodied, but you feel your body, your physical contours have changed along with the surroundings. And you hear a soft series of chimes, like wind chimes, at the sound, the scene gains color and texture, as if the sound is beckoning you gently forth, filling your senses and thoughts like mist rolling softly into a sealed chamber, and the chime coaxes you deeper into the memory, and you're certain it is a memory, a warm one. 
You are standing on the stone of the plateau, your knees on the warm texture of the ground, silver, white, shimmering like Audra. The plateau is formed of it, glistening in the sun. You can feel the heat on your skin, your wrists, and your hands. Your hands are in motion, weaving, not a thread, but a gathering tenderly, moving along the first movements of Barath's wheel. Your hands are wet. Your hands are upon the flesh of a newborn child, and you can feel the crowning of a tiny head turning in your grip, its head slicks, wet from the womb. The hands you are wearing, inhabiting, have done this many times, and they are practiced and confident. You can feel distant pains in your own head as the head emerges, a stream of fluid from the womb helping the newborn slide first, forth, and a woman's labored breathing crying out. As your hands move, you hear the sound of chimes, clear, cutting through the haze of memory. You cannot see where they are coming from, but they are close, and they are meant as comfort of that you are certain. And coaxed by your hands, every movement causing the chimes to sound again. Almost eagerly, the child comes forth, and as it does, your hands are in motion, weaving, weaving, moving along the length of a soft web rope, no, an umbilical cord from the legs of the naked woman before you. Before you. you are holding a small child, still wet from the womb, before you. The child cries out, its cry full of life, full of soul, the ringing of chimes echoing in its thoughts, filling it with welcome. The soul is blurred at the edges as if you are viewing a soul from within a soul, but it is there, it is alive. The woman before you is weeping, and at her first cry her hands reach out for it. You surrender the child to her, something you have done many times before, and as your hands move, the chimes echo the movement, and you realize the chimes are hanging from cords on your wrists. And where they once echoed in the memory, they are now echoing in the child's mind as well. The chimes are intended to welcome the child to be its first gentle greeting into the world, a soothing sound guided by the tender motions of your wrists. You are helping to weave its thoughts, its perceptions, and the experience. The experience. The woman laughs with ragged joy, laughing from a parched throat. Her emotion seems soothed, but the physical demands of labor have left her exhausted. The child is here, the child is safe, and all atop the plateau is peaceful, calm, distant flattening out as the memory persists. With effort, the scene bleeds of color and your mind becomes your own again. There is no pull, no anchor, yet the sound of the chimes remain. As they existed in the memory, they sound here as well, and they are hanging from woven braids on the wrists of the woman before you. Even as your head is spinning from the touch of her mind, the sound of the chimes on her wrists are sharp and clear, as if coaxing you back into the real world. The woman still sits before you, but she is nothing like what you first saw. She is wearing black shredded garments that drape over her form like streamers. Her hair is streaks of black and run through with silver. Her age is almost impossible to tell. She simply feels old, like a crumbled watchtower. As she lifts her head to face you, you see that her hair is draped across the front of her face like a veil. When you first saw of her was a mental glamour of some sort, unconscious, and you realize what you see is not what the world sees, and you are perhaps the first to see her true self. Still, you don't sense a threat in that realization. If anything, you feel a sense of relief at the figure. You can hear her thoughts, and she is glad at last to be seen. What... what was that? I am seen, but the eyes of others do not remember. You were the first to see me as I am, the call stripped aside. There is a light touch on your mind, a caress, and her left hand mirrors the motion of the touch reaching up into the air between you. You hear the chime on her wrist sound softly. Her hand moves as if pantomiming resting on your cheek at a distance, and she speaks softly and slowly. Your memories. Cadence of wheels on a caravan track. Fever. Questions by running water. Violence in a night's campfire. Arrows in the dark. And fleeing. Falling rock and cracking stone and a storm the storm yes the storm that brushed you did it screaming wake you from your mind's cradle your memory of it is painful its cry is difficult to ignore it's like a child many children crying out We were attacked in the woods as we were... No. I encountered a B.O.A.C., yes, and it did something to me. Her hand withdraws shyly, sounding, chime sounding softly once again. The woman stands as certainly as if she's been sitting for some time or is too weak to bear her own weight. You notice her cheekbones are tight, her face gaunt, and yet while her stance is weak, she seems determined to stand before you. You are able to see me. It's almost a question. You suddenly realize she doesn't seem to know what you saw when you looked at her. 
The image on the plateau, yet the image was so clear, so sharp, you're surprised she didn't feel you there. You see me as a rare gift. A watcher's gift. Uh, how was I able to enter your dream? So many questions, thoughts, whirling like storm winds. That storm still roars through you, deep beneath your thoughts, yet muted and secret, like an underground river. I cannot tell if it is carving new channels, or eroding what keeps your true strength buried. Hmm. Would both of those be good things? The fact that you could hear it at all, survive it, is something few have ever done. Your power will grow stronger with each soul you touch, as it allowed you to reach out to mine. There is a silence, and although it seems to last but for but a heartbeat, in your thoughts it stretches out between the two of you like the pole between your minds. You blink, take a breath, and you realize she wants to ask you a question, yet can't form the words, as if assembling them is painful. Or there are simply not enough pieces. Do you wish to travel with me? Then fear dissipates and you feel strength and certainty as if the plateau from her memory lies beneath you. A calm sky looks down upon you. Oh, she's a cipher. And she's the last of the companions that we can recruit. Well, I don't really know anything about a cipher except that they're a melee fighter mage character class. Um, I would walk with you, see through your eyes, watcher, and feel your footfalls echoed in my thoughts. Perhaps together we can make sense of what is broken within and without. The young woman leans against the wagon. One arm and one side of her face are covered in bandages with raw, rippled flesh sewing underneath. A minty, tangy scent wafts from her dressing. Just ventured into town? I'm about dry on some of my stalks, but you're welcome to have a look. Uh, how did you get so burned? By the flame. How bad does it look? Just say it. I know you'll tell me straight. Uh, who cares how it looks? What matters is that you're okay. Suppose you're right. Good thing I know my poultices. I've been keeping an eye on a drake's nest east of town at Deerford Crossing. The beast stayed long enough to try and lay a clutch, and then moved on. Thank the Sky Mother it wasn't a full-grown dragon. Fresh eggs are much more useful than the ones that get passed between merchants or left in nests for weeks or more, and that clutch looked to be at its peak. Thought I'd see about getting an egg, but I didn't realize so many of them had already hatched, or that young worms are so territorial. Uh, what's so special about these eggs? I thought an educated sort like you would know for sure. They're one of the strongest tonics known to Kith. If you leave out Karo Golan, of course, not saying anyone should take that, but dragon eggs are known to make Kith bold, purposeful. Some even think they'll protect from Beowax. All I know is everyone's pining after potions made from dragon eggs. But the damn roads can't reach none of my suppliers, and so I'm stuck with whatever I can scrounge up in the wood. Deer crap, river reed, and the like. Uh, I could get an egg for you. I show up you're not leading me on. I don't think I could stand getting burned again. <laughs> you really mean to go after it? I'd certainly pay you. Just remember, big as they are, dragon eggs are fragile, and there's a lot more I can do with a whole one. How do you do? Um, uh, looking for an Orlin named Nearfree. I did see an organ lady headed into the Dracogen just the other day. Don't know what her name was, but she was acting real sneaky like. What's wrong with the roads? brigands, looters, you name it. The gods may be hollowing out our babies, but it's grown folk that's robbing the rest of us. People are scrambling on to Defiance Bay because they hear there's healthy births there, and all those refugees in abandoned homes attract desperate sorts like flies on dog shit. <laughs> Alright, show me your wares. Um... Oh, you have a bunch of herbs, but not the one I'm looking for. building. 
sounds like the person, the Orlin I'm looking for is in the inn. We'll get there eventually. But I'm going to go around to the other buildings first. Ooh, a soul fragment. You see a modestly furnished house, warm from the cooking fire, as lit at its far end. This man is sitting in a high-backed chair, looking at a large book with a small boy in his lap. He smiles and asks the child about the pictures on the pages as he points to different parts of them. He looks up as a woman approaches to stir something in the pot hanging over the fire. She adds some carrots to the pot, mixes them in, and then stands and turns to the man. She says something to him and leans in to give him a kiss when there's a knock at the door. The man makes a stand and the woman motions for him to stay. She walks to the door and glances out the window, but it's already too dark for anything outside to be seen. She lifts the bolts in the door and pulls it open, revealing a tall, lanky man with a strange smile on his face. There's a wet, tearing sound, and the woman makes a weak groan, collapsing to the floor, blood coolly, pooling, quickly pooling around her. The man in the chair leaps to his feet, grabbing his son, interposing himself between the boy and the man at the door, who steps over the body and enters the house. Garlic vowed you would feel his pain, the man says conversationally as four other men enter the house behind him. It appears your rent has come due. Hmm. Task collection completes you a side adventure with a generation of crafting ingredients confer as you complete quests. Kind of an odd mechanic. That's fragrant. Who was that directed at? Alright, Tiggle, what do you have to say for yourself? Sturdy, broad-shouldered man wipes his hot hands on his slacks. He reeks of the same foul compound wrapped in your guts, and his arms are stained with dye. You looking to purchase some leather? Uh, Rumball mentioned something about an ogre. He's hardly talked about anything else since those pigs of his went missing. The whole town's been worried about that monster. People are starting to see shapes in their windows at night, hearing its growl and the snoring of their mates. It would put a lot of minds at ease if someone got rid of it. I sometimes venture into the wilderness, collecting ingredients for my dyes, mind you. I've seen tracks east of here, near the river, that couldn't have been anything else. Something else you need? What's in the collapsed tower? It's collapsed. Nothing. A few hides on stretching racks, and the tallow stench Denglar is always drumming about. The rest of it keeps dust, just like that fool lady Thanu who tried to hold it. There's a bard at the inn who'll tell you the whole blazing story if you want to hear it. Uh, have you seen that? Uh, okay. What do you got for sale? Exceptional hide and leather armor, huh? For cheap? Wow, that's really cheap. Yeah. Oh, you got some stuff in here. People hit damage taken. I don't know, I don't care about that. Regeneration. Now that I can definitely get behind. Um, let's see, and it's only 825? Seems like a steal. Um, we can probably find some stuff to sell. Uh, here, we can sell this fine hide armor to you. You want that? Seems to seem to be right up your ally alley. Uh, we can sell you some of this. Some of those. Some of those. Um, some of those. Actually, maybe we should keep this. 
We did just pick up a couple of new characters. Maybe we'll keep one of those too. All right. Um, all right, who gets the regeneration belt? You don't have a belt. You have the DR belt. You already regenerate hit points, though. Really, this should go to my paladin, is who should get this. Um, so maybe I'll hang on to it until she's back in the party. No real point in giving it to the ranger. Well, I mean, there's a point, but... That'd be much better for the paladin. looking for. Yeah, apparently there's a noble dot nobleman's daughter missing. I wonder if it's the Orland girl? An Orland nobleman? No, that seems unlikely. a forest clearing, fog curling through weeds on the ground in the cold morning air. The serenity of the scene is occasionally broken by a faint noise that echoes through the silence. This woman emerges from the trees and stops, dropping to the ground. She creeps to the edge of the clearing and crouches near a tree. She glances around furtively, listening intently in the glowing light. growing light. She presses her back to the tree, tensing against it, ready to spring forward. From the distance comes another sound, a rustling in the undergrowth. With that, she shoots forward, keeping as low to the ground as she can. She puts a hand to her throat and makes a sound, a shrill bird call, but what emerges from her mouth seems to emanate from yards away. From behind here, near the source of the rustling, there's a brief grunting noise that is quickly silenced. She dives into a large bush at the end of the tree line, keeping her head down and wriggling silently through the leaves and twigs. She takes position in the bushes, turning to face the direction she came. She raises her hand again, this time mimicking a steel gar, placing the roar directly behind the men, failing to sneak up on her. More than one voice answers this call, all of them sounding panic and hurried, and all of them quickly moving this way, all thoughts of stealth forgotten. She backs out from under the bush to crouch behind it. As she pulls the bow from her back, she takes a shooting stance and waits for her hunters to appear. Hmm. Hail, traveler. A portly, smiling man stands behind a warped wooden counter, polishing a buckler. He looks up. Haven't seen you before. Always glad to see a new face in town. Company's good for business and shattered's good for the soul. That's what I always say. Anyhow, what can I do for you? What's been going on in Deerford? Oh, we're a quiet little town. Not much happens here, especially not since the legacy hit. People realized they couldn't have babies and just stopped trying altogether. And that takes a lot of the excitement out of the day-to-day, -day, if you could believe it. <laughs> wow, that's expensive. Wow. That's really good, though. Woo! Accurate three. It doesn't even have a weapon quality enchantment. You can put exceptional on it. This is really, oops. This is really good, though. Um, I really like 
those fast draining weapons. Uh, this is good for a paladin. Um, sure, it's cheap. I'll pick it up. Oh, that was 1.2 chant area of effect. What am I wearing? That's not me. Sure, I'll pick that up too. Um, I got tons of rope and grappling hooks, a, ton, a couple of hammer and chisers, but only one pry bar. So let's grab a pry bar. And let's go ahead and sell some stuff here. Got all these crucible plate armors. We'll probably sell our regular plate armors. And most of these. Maybe we'll keep one of those. One of those. Well, we've already paid for all of that. All right. Let me just let me just see here. see what I would be left with. Two fine pistols? I don't need two fine pistols. Especially when I have that. So this would cost me. <laughs> This is a really good combination. Alright, so that would leave me with, what, 4,000 copper? I'm going to do it. That is, yeah, it's, it's 
is significant. This is probably better than Justice, but not significantly better. And it's a character that's not always in my party. This character is, this guy is always going to be. Alright, I'm going to do it. Um, I'll just take that in the stash, give that to him. Um, what am I wearing? Minor cloak of protection. Alright, I guess this is a little bit better. Uh, who could use a minor cloak of protection? Somebody who doesn't have a ring of protection. Um, let's see, you already have better. You already have a minor cloak of protection. Somebody has better neck items already. Alright, well, I'm gonna. Let's see, I'm gonna stash that. These two I'll hang on to until the paladin comes back. Alright. And I could put a damage enchant on this. Um, or I could put Kit Slaying on it. Put a damage enchant and one of these on it. No, I'm not sure which one I would choose. I think I'll leave it alone for now and think about it a little bit. Oh, you know what? It has accuracy. That counts as a quality enchant, doesn't it? Alright, it's not quite as good as I thought it was. I think a damage enchant is probably better than Kith Slaying. Still looking, huh? Alright, let's head into the end. We still have the last in bonus on us? We do. I'm not in a huge. Probably not gonna rest here. Oh, uh, yeah, probably not. Sid. I just want to find her. Redhead. Surely even you can understand that. Redhead says by the fire, chewing her loot and plucking its strings. She hums snatches of a melody as she goes. First time at the Dracogen? Normally I'd have a song ready, but I haven't quite worked out this tune yet. I'm writing some chants about the founding of this inn. Say, you interested in the story? I haven't finished the chants, but I could tell you about it all the same. Sure. It was built in the time of Hadrat's Rebellion, and Adir and Lady, Th Lady Thainu once had a keep here. One of the towers still stands, but the rest is said to be buried under the village. Anyway, she's stuck to the side of the Empire, and a contingent of Duke Hadrat's Knights of the Crucible helped the farmers and colonists in the area turn her keep into rubble. The inn was the first building that sprang up from the ruin, built with some of the same bricks the colonists had pulled from the Lady Thanu's castle, they say. Supposedly, the quarterstaff of her chief wizard even got lost in the construction, mortared into a wall or nailed under a floorboard. Anyway, the inn was supposed to be a haven and a meeting place while the locals built their new town. What's a Lady Thanu? A thane, or thanu, is a man or woman who's part of the military elite, a knight, if you will. Typically, the position is inherited. A lord thane, or a lady thanu, owns land and also commands several unlanded thanes. The woman who last held the keep here came from a long line of landed thanes. Okay. 
Uh, what do you mean supposed to be? Fearwoodians are an ordinary lot, and the more these new neighbors met, the more they argued. They realized they didn't agree on much besides ousting the old lord. The biggest divide was over the Glenfathans and the nearby ruins. Hadrid's knights and their supporters wanted to keep the peace, but the group of misfits with the more anarchic leanings that had formed in town wanted to go after the tribes the same way they'd gone after their lord. Soon, the villagers were fighting with each other as much as with the Adirans. In the end, the memories of the Broken Storm War and the War of the Black Trees were fresh enough that the Duke's soldiers won the day. Most of the other villages came around eventually, but some of the core troublemakers left to join the front lines of the War of Defiance, and others, I've heard, found their way into the Gilded Guided Compass, the most forward-looking of the Gunfobin tribes. I don't know if I believe that part myself, but it makes a good story. There's a portrait of one of the chief rabble-rousers and his rival in the peacekeeping faction. Santon's idea of a joke. I don't think they were particularly amused. Alright, I know about those wars already. We're decent folk, my lord. Perhaps you should leave and check the wilds. He's looking for his daughter. You see this woman running through the streets of a small city. She pushes her way through the crowd, glancing over her shoulder as she does. Her clothing is torn and her hair disheveled. Even though she appears to be attempting to escape from someone, her eyes sparkle with joy. Her mouth is pulled back in an enormous grin, and occasionally a small giggle works its way out of her throat. She just pulled a trick on somebody. While looking over her shoulder, she runs headlock into a well-dressed man standing at one of the market stalls. The moment she sees the man she's run into, her face changes. Gone is the glee, replaced by fear. Her grin twists into a frown, its bottom lip quivering. The man, seeing her appearance, expresses concern for her well-being, and she leans against him, weaving a tale of a brutish man with wandering hands. As she speaks, her own hands travel over his body, seeking and exploring. There's a shout from the crowd, and they both look over and see a large, angry man approaching, roughly pushing his way through the crowd that separates them. She stiffens against him, feigning fear. The man tells her not to be afraid and steps in front of her to block the path of the figure who is coming nearer. The woman smiles, slowly backing away from them both, and lets out a gleeful checker. chuckle, cackle. Her protector turns, confused, and sees her departing, laughing and shaking a coin purse. She spins and races through the crowded marketplace. Confused, the man feels at his belt. His face hardens and he yells, joining the chase after the laughing woman losing herself in the crowd. So she's a thief. Uh, Yorn. Why, it's you. Thank you, friend. You've given me another chance, and I mean to make the most of it. I've been telling everyone around here about how you helped me. Peace. How do you do? The innkeeper digs inside a mug with a dirty rag. His eyes under his thick brows are tired but watchful. He gives you a quick nod as you approach the bar. Don't see many travelers these days. Something I can do for you? What was that ex your exchange with that nobleman about? Folk around here are decent. They mind their own business. You want to stick your nose in it? Go talk to him yourself. Uh, I have questions about Deerford. Have you seen an oiling called Nefri? Twitchy lady, that one. Tell me about the village. Walk from one bridge to the next and you've seen it. We're quiet, hard-working folk. We keep to ourselves and don't take to being pushed around. Used to be a castle here, built by a family of Adir and Thanes back when the Empire first came. Only one tower is still standing, and that's part of Tigril's shop now. Sid, that bar by the fire, could spin you the yarn. Uh, who lives here? Not many anymore. Hard to keep people around when everybody here is birthing Hollowborn. But we got a few who stick around and do business. Tiggles the leather, uh, leather cur, Hedina's craft potions, and Winfrith trades in general goods. Rumbold's a pig farmer, or was, anyway. Alright, I've already spoken to all of them. You don't see many travelers. Of course not. Why would they come here? We got bandits on the road and an ogre in the forest, as that yapping fool Rumbald will tell you. Worse yet, there hasn't been a healthy child born here in over a year. Most kith that come here is just passing through. Uh, Alright, what rooms do you have? You have the stables. You get plus two dexterity room. That's pretty good. Plus two might, plus two constitution, plus two intellect. That is also very good. 
Um. Alright, we got a new soul fragment here. Let's get through that very quickly. You see a man open the door of a house, slow with fatigue. He steps inside, unlacing his boots, rubbing his temples, wrinkle of a smile lighting his face as he moves into a generous kitchen. He calls for someone, slicing himself some bread. The house creaks gently in response. His lips purse, and he pads out of the kitchen into a large room with a staircase. Chewing slowly, he takes the stairs one at a time, calling once more. No response. His body freezes for a moment as he walks into a room of stairs, nothing on the lone bed but an abundance of faded felt toys. Moving faster, he checks each room, his calls growing more urgent. No response. Any sign of exhaustion is gone, replaced with limber panic. He checks cupboards, baths, anywhere a child might hide. Nothing. Then, a letter next to the door he came in from, with a queer symbol on its wax seal, one he's seen before. He crumples, shoulders sh shaking against a hard wall. Nobody sees him weep. This man wears an airdier style robe, simple yet elegant. His fine leather shoes look like they were made for padding around indoors, yet they're caked with mud. He yanks at a lock of hair twined around his silk glove finger. His fine features are etched with anxiety. My child is out there. Do they not understand? My lord, we're doing everything we can. Unfortunately, these villagers... Beasts take them all. I don't care how you do it, but find her. Your child is missing, I take it? Yes, Lady Alice. My daughter. I've asked around, but nobody in this mud hole has any concerns beyond their swine. We turn my men away like beggars and seem downright pleased to be of no use. But you... You're not one of my soldiers. And you look like you're used to getting your hands dirty, if you don't mind my saying so. He raises a hand and silence the man. If you find her, tell her I won't be upset with her. She can come back and all will be well. I just want to make sure my Elise, my child, is safe. Nothing in the world is more important to me. Elise. Of course. Describe her. She's a striking young woman, bears more resemblance to her mother than to me. She has auburn hair and delicate, well-bred features. She must be, oh, 28 or 29 now. We'd stopped in Deerford for a few days. On our fourth evening here, I was making plans to continue our journey. Lady Elise was feeling unwell and went to bed. When I retired a couple hours later, I find that she had found that she had vanished. None of my men had seen her go, and no, at the in no one at the inn knew where she was. Since then, my people have been combing the village, but we've yet to find a clue, and the locals have been no help. Why did you come here? It was merely a stop along the way to Ina's rest. However, she took ill shortly before our arrival, so it seemed prudent to allow her a few days to recover. Why are you going to Enya's rest? Lady Elise has reached an age where it is prudent for her to marry. Given this legacy business, I can't let her fertile years slip by, nor do I want her room to fester in the presence of so many hollowborn. Uh, it seems that there would be more potential suitors in New Heomar or New Yarma. If you haven't considered that, arranging a suitable match is difficult. The best prospects for my child lay in Enya's rest. Where's the rest of your family? Surely they wouldn't want to miss your daughter's betrothal. Lady Harad is here suited for travel, I'm afraid, and unfortunately Elise has few other close relatives. My sister and her husband, a lady's aunt and uncle, of course, have been mis visiting Adir for these last months. And as for siblings, Elise has none. My wife has only given birth to Holoborn, since Elise, that is. I see, but coming back to your daughter... Tell me about I'm yourself. Lord Nestor Harren of Defiance Bay. My family has been prominent there since Imperial times. Our primary estate is on the outskirts of Brackenbury, but we have holdings in New Heomar as well. Those went to my sister and her husband. Mm -hmm. Search Deerford. Does that mean I have to go talk to everybody again? Probably. Well, this episode has been going on for long enough, I think, so I'm going to put a cut in here. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider liking the video. Either way, I hope you all have a terrific day.